So, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Sam and this is Noah, and we're both engineers at AWS who work in the containers group. Today we're here to talk to you about Firecracker Container D, which is an open source project that aims to make it easier to run containers with hypervisor-mediated isolation provided by the Firecracker VMM. This is the agenda for today's talk. We're going to start with a super brief overview of containers and just the aspects of containers that are interesting for the purposes of this talk. Then we're going to move on into the technology used that when running containers to talk about container runtimes and container D. We'll start talking about the Firecracker virtual machine monitor. Then we'll talk about what it takes to bring Firecracker and container D together. Noah's going to have a really brief demo. Uh, we'll talk about where the project is today and finally have some time for questions. So we'll start with a, a, a brief overview of just what containers are. Um, it's a pretty broad term, but today we're going to focus on primarily the use cases for containers. Um, they're a mechanism for distributing and running software with varying degrees of isolation and repeatability and standardized tooling. Containers have grown really popular because of some of the things that they enable. Containers make it easy to have a repeatable deployment. Um, a major challenge with software in software deployment can be the drift between systems, including dependencies that are installed and configuration on a particular machine. Containers don't have access to the host file system by default, which means that you tend to bundle all of the dependencies for each container inside of the image, including shared libraries like glibc, and you have an image-based deployment. The advantage of this is that you know ahead of time all the same versions of the dependencies are present. Container images are also designed to be efficient, both in terms of storage and in terms of network transfer. Container images typically employ a layer-based approach where only deltas or differences between layers need to be transferred or stored. And when you start a new container, typically the container system will employ a copy on write mechanism so that there's no copying needed ahead of time when you're starting up a container. Containers are also pretty flexible. It's really common to have a single purpose container and to build a complete application by composing multiple containers together. You can, and usually do, have a separate file system, but you can optionally share things like networks so your applications in different containers commu can communicate over localhost, or to share a subset of the file system, or to let them use Unix IPC. Because of containers' repeatability, they also help with deployment automation. It's easier to rely on containers be being deployed correctly because of that property. The flexibility in sharing resources between containers makes it easier to have single-purpose containers and to compose them together. This means you can have a web server in one container, application code in another, and monitoring infrastructure in a third, and that makes it easier to use off-the-shelf software and even off-the-shelf container images. This has also led to the popularity of large-scale orchestration systems focused on containers, like Kubernetes or Amazon ECS, to make it easier to deploy and manage containers in production systems. And deployment systems like these have popularized multi-container workloads where a given application is comprised of multiple parts that are deployed together, share some resources, and work together. These multi-container workloads are enshrined as the basic unit de of deployment in the form of Kubernetes pod or an ECS task. Linux containers are made up of a collection of Linux kernel primitives working together. This is enough for a talk on its own, and I gave one yesterday. Um, so if there should be a recording of that posted online. But I do want to touch on them here as they really make up, make up a lot of the flexibility of containers. Namespaces serve as the primary mechanism for controlling visibility and providing separation of things like networks, process IDs, and file systems. Control groups, as they're commonly used in containers, provide a mechanism to limit the quantity of resources used, like memory, CPU, or block I.O., or to control access to devices. Capabilities provide somewhat finer control over per permissions than just a root user or a non-root user. SecComp provides mechanisms to restrict the allowable syscalls for a given process. Linux security modules like SE Linux and AppArmor provide ways to restrict access to resources like files. And finally, union file systems provide the mechanism by which image layers work, allowing containers to conserve disk space and reduce network transfer when they're being downloaded. Containers fundamentally share a Linux kernel. The Linux technologies that make up a container are really flexible, and the fact that these, container, that these technologies are built into Linux makes containers run quickly with very little overhead. Virtual machines are a little bit more isolated. They virtualize or emulate hardware components, and you need to run a full operating system on top of the VM in order to use it. They also need to take care of the boot process, including initializing all of the hardware components 
VMs thus typically have a little bit more overhead than containers. So if VMs have more overhead, why would you want them? Generally, we believe that VMs are easier to reason about. With a virtual machine, there's a single kernel per VM, and it only has access to that individual machine. In contrast with containers, all containers running on the same host share a single Linux kernel. Sharing a Linux kernel means sharing all of the kernel interfaces, and that is a pretty large surface area. There are lots of Linux syscalls, lots of data exposed in the proc file system or sysfile system, and it can be really challenging to reason about the interaction with all of them. With a VM, you're making it look like hardware, and you have the option to make it look like very simple hardware with very straightforward interactions and well-known standardized hardware interfaces. This makes it easier to reason about from a security and isolation perspective, and a great place to establish trust and resource boundaries, which make it good when running things like multi-tenant workloads, like in the cloud. Or workloads where you don't really trust some software, for example, transcoding user-submitted video, audio, or images with tools like FFmpeg or ImageMagick. So what do we mean by isolation? In AWS, which if you don't know is a fairly large cloud provider, we believe our first responsibility of this is the security of the infrastructure. That means protecting customers from malicious actors or attackers at the infrastructure layer, even if those malicious actors look like other customers. So we care a lot about isolation, and we believe really strongly in defense in depth, by which I mean that we use different mechanisms to protect against multiple kinds of threats. Among other ways of thinking about security, we like to use a classification system called STRIDE, which stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, and escalation of privilege. This is how we break down the different threats that face a given system. We build a threat model that outlines threats in these categories, figure out multiple mitigations for those threats, and figure out multiple mitigations for those threats. The Linux primitives that make up what we call containers are not very new, and they do have a lot of great ways to increase isolation between workloads and enforce separation, including things like seccomp uh, that limits the kind of syscalls a program can make or Linux security modules. They also have things like capabilities that attempt to make finer grain permissions uh, and more things like and more things. But the flexibility and configuration for containers exposes threats like tampering, information disclosure, and escalation pr of privilege, unless you take extremely careful approach toward configuring those things. And fundamentally, the Linux kernel wasn't really designed with all these use cases in mind. And all the techniques that are needed to take, I'm sorry, I've lost where I am in my notes. All the techniques needed to all of these techniques needed to take into account existing Linux programs that were built to run on kernels that didn't have any of these features. In the cloud, we've relied on hypervisors and virtualization for a long time. Hypervisors protect well against the kinds of threats that containers expose, and we're generally happier relying on a mechanism like that which does not involve sharing the Linux kernel. But isolation isn't really enough on its own. We want to meet our customers where they are and enable all the kinds of workloads that they want to run. Over the past few years, Linux containers have grown increasingly, increasingly popular due in large part to the Docker toolchain and the easy user experience it provided. Docker's immutable images, easy way to save and pass around those images, and easy command line interface have really helped to drive this popularity. Container orchestrators like Amazon ECS, Kubernetes, and Mesos have also grown in popularity as means to run and manage containers at scale. And container orchestrators like this have made it easy to have multiple containers deployed and composed together as a single unit, like an ECS tag, task, or a Kubernetes pod. As Docker has evolved, and as the container landscape has matured, some standards have emerged in the ecosystem. One of the bodies responsible for those standards is the Open Containers Initiative, a part of the Linux Foundation, whose members include maintainers of Docker and various other parties interested in, impro in improving the container ecosystem. OCI has established a few standards that are relevant to container users and to, fi and to the Firecracker ContainerD project we're talking about today. Those include the image standard, which defines how a container file system and default container configuration should be represented, and the container runtime standard, which is meant to make it easier to have alternative ways to run containers. Kubernetes has also established an interface for running for runtimes called CRI, or the Container Runtime Interface. Compliant runtimes with CRI can be used pretty easily with Kubernetes. All right. So Sam has sort of introduced this um, this concept of the the orchestrator and the, uh, the the tooling like ECS or Kubernetes or Mesos um, that uh, that are designed as what we call in this case cluster orchestrators. We're going to put those at the top of this stack. Uh, 
where a cluster orchestrator is something that's, that's managing containers um, across multiple hosts. And so this is typically used to coordinate um, the providing of a service or something like that. You know, usually it will involve um, uh, integration with load balancers or other network services, uh, things along those lines. So this is something you see a lot in production these days. Um, the, the next layer down on our stack is a, we'll call a local orchestrator. So Docker is the most common one. Um, it's, it's not the only one, but these days it's, it's, it's the one that you're almost certainly uh, using. Um, a lot of the cluster orchestrators actually do interface with, um, with a local orchestrator for, for some of the um, uh, configuration and, and management of containers on the local host. Um, but a local orchestrator basically is going to provide a lot of the same services and same functionality as a, as a cluster orchestrator, just scaled down to a, a, the scope of a single host. Um, so it'll allow you to manage the, the life cycle of a container, uh, the configuration of a container, including its local network configuration, uh, what storage resources it has access to, etc. Docker today, modern Docker versions uh, use a component called ContainerD for local management. Um, ContainerD actually originated from within Docker. It's a component that was spun out of, of the Docker project and is a standalone component now. Uh, ContainerD is a management component for containers. It's, it's the tool that's responsible for the actual life cycle of a container. It's, it's responsible for starting the container and and tracking its state throughout its life, um, maybe collecting metrics on it, um, reacting to certain events, including the, the termination of the container, um, of the containerized process and that sort of thing. Um, and then below there is the, is the, uh, the runtime. Uh, typically on Linux systems today with standard containers as you're using them, that runtime is, is run C. Run C is the reference implementation of the OCI container specification. Um, it's responsible for actually creating the container. Uh, so by creating the container, that means it's setting up the, the Linux resources, the namespaces, the C groups, the, um, the, the file system mounts, and that sort of thing. Um, and so what we're going to talk about today, for the most part, is the, the lowest two uh, layers in this stack. Um, if you're familiar with Git, you can sort of think of, of the lower two layers as the, as the plumbing layers and the layers above as the, as the porcelain, if you're familiar with that sort of that terminology. Uh, so normally you don't interact directly with either of those two layers as a, as a user of containers, but, um, but through a, a front end. So, Container runtimes are a mechanism for starting and, and, and managing container workloads. Um, they set up the C groups, they, the namespaces, the file systems and capabilities, and all the various other uh, Linux primitives that are involved in, in, in providing that container abstraction. Uh, the, the, the containers that we use today adhere to the OCI runtime specification, which came from the, it originated with the behavior of Docker's containers. Uh, it was contributed to the Open Containers Initiative by Docker. Um, and what it basically does is it defines a CLI for like a command line for actually invoking a containerized uh, process with a given configuration. Um, it's specified with a bundle, which is a JSON object that describes the resources and configuration and a root file system that describes or that, that actually contains the content of the, uh, the file systems that the container will run with. So run C is the actual name of the implementation. It's the reference implementation for OCI containers and it originated with Docker. <coughs> ContainerD is a, another component that spun out of Docker. It's a daemon for managing containers. Um, it's a modular framework um, for, for, for providing these services. Uh, it's, a, it's managed today by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the CNCF. Um, it, it, it integrates with, with Run C and with its own uh, container DV2 runtime. So if we take 
a little bit of a look at the ContainerD stack, what we can see is that it has a number of different components. And we'll, we're going to talk specifically about a few of these. But the right now, the, the, uh, an overview of this gives you, we have the gRPC API. This is the interface that you would use to write code that interfaces with ContainerD that controls it and manipulates uh, containers using its services. It provides two different types of storage service that, that have different roles within container management. The content store is what's responsible for actually storing the layer content that's re retrieved from a container registry, and then the snapshotters, which are responsible for uh, actually providing file system images. We'll talk a little bit more in uh, depth about both of those. Then there's the runtime component, which is uh, Run C or any OCI compatible uh, container runtime, or a its custom V2 runtime. It's also got a plugin uh, interface, and it supports a couple of different types of plugins. We're going to talk in a little bit more detail about both of those. So the content, the content uh, store component. Um, is responsible for actually storing the containers that you've retrieved from a container registry, say Docker Hub or something like that. When you download those, those are downloaded as tar files. The content uh, store plugin will, is responsible for tracking those, uh, those tar files and storing them on disk. The snapshotter is, if you've used Docker and you're familiar at all with its uh, graph drivers or its storage drivers, the snapshotter is basically that same functionality. It's a different design, it's a different implementation, uh, it's a more modular implementation, and it's actually one of the reasons why we chose ContainerD for integration with Firecracker. What, what the snapshotter does is it's responsible for taking each of the different layers as represented by tarballs downloaded and stored from by the, the content plugin. And, and, and turning those into a file system. How it does that, it can be pretty, it's, it's, it's pretty much up to the Snapshotter plugin itself to, to decide that. As long as what it hands off at the end looks like a file system, it's, it can do whatever it wants to do. Um, so we'll have a custom Snapshotter that we're gonna talk about in a little bit for, for this project. And then there's the runtime component, which we'll uh, go into some more detail about. Um, the runtime is the, the low-level instantiation of containers. So this may, be, uh, this may be by way of Run C, maybe by way of some custom thing, it may be by way of a, a container D uh, v2 runtime. Um, that was something that was introduced by Container D to be a little bit more flexible than, than the strict OCI definition. Um, and, and that's actually something what we've chosen to implement with Firecracker Container D. We're going to hear a little bit more about how and why we've done that a little bit later. Now it's also, it's got a plugin system, so the, a lot of these components can actually be developed as, as a standalone projects um, that, that can be loaded at runtime. So for the, in the case of, um, of, of most of the components that we've had to write, they're actually, they don't even need to live in the ContainerD code base at all. They're their own projects, their own, their own GitHub repositories and that sort of thing that provide certain interfaces and they can plug in directly to ContainerD. Um, using just a little bit of configuration. Um, it's also possible to write in-process plugins, and we do have uh, uh, one of those that we will talk about a little bit. So we'll talk now a little bit about Firecracker itself. That's the thing that we're actually really interested in here. It's what we're trying to integrate into ContainerD. Um, Firecracker is it's based on the Linux KVM virtualization subsystem. Uh, it was announced at, um, at AWS reInvent conference in November. Uh, so it's been around for, it's been public for about six months now. It was developed uh, at AWS, targeted specifically at Lambda and Fargate. So a lot of the, the sort of newer compute, uh, sort of you know, serverless type workloads, it's designed to be very small, have very low overhead, it provides a, a minimal device model. It's, very, it's a very simple system. It has a limited set of features. It's designed to, to boot very quickly and have a very low memory overhead. It's designed to be very much like a container, but using a hypervisor to provide isolation. For the reasons that Sam talked about earlier, we think that hypervisors are a more reliable 
isolation mechanism for running multi-tenant or multi-user workloads. So we'll go into a little bit more now to the specific design philosophy around Firecracker. It was designed from the beginning with security in mind. And what we mean by that is it has a very limited device model. So there's, there's not a lot of code to it. The code base is really quite small. It doesn't implement a lot of the legacy devices that you might see in a traditional VM. Um, so it doesn't have a, doesn't implement things like a floppy drive, um, like, like some other uh, VM systems do. Um, it really doesn't even implement a, a PC BIOS or a motherboard. There's no virtual uh, PCI bus or anything along those lines. So it's a very, very simple device model, very limited. Uh, the feature set is in itself intentionally very limited. The, the goal is to really minimize ha how the virtualized guest can interact with the host that, that's, that's running the system. It's designed with modern security systems like SecComp built in. So we can see that you know, this is intended to limit the number of, of uh, system calls that the VMM can make. So if, uh, if it were to make some unexpected system call, the, the thing would crash. It's, it's designed to be pretty well locked down. It was, it's written in Rust, so it's a modern memory safe programming language. The intent there is to eliminate classes of, of common bugs and, and errors that, uh, around memory handling in some of these traditional systems programming languages like C. It's also designed to, with a limit, to limit blast radius by having a single, uh, single virtual machine per firecracker process. There's no sharing of resources, or sharing of resources is, is as minimized as possible. It's designed to be very efficient, so it has a very fast boot time. Uh, that's something that we actually enforce in the regression tests on, in, in Firecracker itself. Uh, it has to boot within a, you know, within a very specific time, and you know, it has to begin executing user space code very, very quickly. Uh, it has a very low memory overhead and, and CPU overhead, so it's, you should be able to run lots of these on a host. And interaction with it is, is API driven. So it's designed to be driven by some, some higher level tooling that, that, that coordinates and orchestrates and manages the Firecracker VM. So the goals of Firecracker Container D then are to integrate the Firecracker system with common container tooling and, and workflows. So what we want to do, is we want to support the same container images that you use with, with Docker today. We don't want you to have to actually think about the fact that you're using Firecracker. We want you to be able to pull an image and run your container. Um, so we need to support the, the OCI image specification and, and, uh, and, and be able to run an unmodified, we don't need you, want you to have to build a special image to run in Firecracker. Uh, we want you to be able to use familiar tooling. So that means the, the orchestrators that you're using and that sort of thing, that should all work. Um, we, so the workflows that you're using today, when you want to build your container image, deploy your container image, that should continue to work. Composable containers, so sharing resources across containers by mounting the same file system in, between two different containers, allowing uh, producer or consumer type relationship between processes in different containers. That is a very, very common thing to see in container deployments. We need to be able to support that. So that means we need to have some way of running multiple containers within one of these Firecracker VMs so that they can share resources at the process level the way that a traditional container does. And we need to integrate with orchestrators like Kubernetes and ECS and, and, and that sort of thing. And again, minimal overhead. This is something that we focus on throughout everything that we do. Security as well. Uh, we want to take advantage of this hypervisor-based isolation so that you can use Firecracker Container D to deploy containers in that potentially run mixed trust workloads, multi-customer mm -hmm. workloads, things along those lines. So how do we make Firecracker like a container. There's some considerations around how this is going to work given that Firecracker has such a limited feature set. It, Firecracker itself can't access 
file systems on, on the host. Um, it doesn't support device hot plug at all. Um, all of those, all of that, tech, all of those techniques involve hardware emulation. So in order to hot plug a device today on a Linux system, you need a PCI bus or an ACPI bus or both. Um, you have very limited networking uh, options. So traditional containers use uh, something called a VEF pair, which is a, a pair of Ethernet devices where you put a packet on one end and it pops out the other end magically. Firecracker doesn't actually support that, so we need to do something there. Um, and we need some way of orchestrating uh, um, and, and, and managing the containerized process inside of Firecracker. So we need some kind of, of cross-boundary communication. So that's, we, we use VSOC for that. And so we have to think about how it is that we're going to do that. Um, so with all those considerations in mind and all those limitations, uh, what do we have to do to work with a container management demon like Container D? Uh, the first thing that we had to do was deal with the fact that a traditional container is, has assumes that it has access to file system resources on the host, such as you know the, the root file system of the container or the ability to mount other uh, other file systems or other uh, local system resources into the container. So we've had to write our own custom snapshotters uh, that, that that present the root file system of the container as a block device to the Firecracker VM rather than as a directory on disk that is essentially to root it into. Uh, we've had to define new APIs for managing the VM lifecycle uh, using the Firecracker API and that sort of thing. Uh, container D itself doesn't have a notion of a VM wrapper around a container. It just knows about the container. So somewhere along the lines, we had to introduce something that allowed Container D to run this VM such that it could put a container in it. And the way that we did that was we split the shim, which is the runtime component of Containerd, into two parts. Um, we kept one, one part on the outside, that's the sort of front end that Containerd itself interacts with. And then on the back end, we, we, we created an agent component that is the, 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 the other half of the, the shim. And that runs inside the VM, and that actually invokes run C, just like Containerd does on a, on a non-firecracker container. Um, for the network, uh, we have a uh, Firecracker presents a Linux tap device. That's the only network device that it supports. Um, and so in order to make that look like a beef pair uh, or one end of a beef pair, uh, we use a technique uh, called um, TC mirroring. So if you've used the traffic control subsystem, the TC command in, in Linux, it has a sort of obscure feature that allows it to take traffic and just reflect it to a different interface transparently. Uh, and so using, using that technique, we're able to make this tap device look like one end of the VEF pair that a container, that a traditional container is, is typically networked using. So we're gonna go a little bit more in depth into these various components. And Sam will talk through some of these <coughs> So uh, this diagram shows a little bit about how contain the Containerd runtime creates Firecracker micro VMs and runs containers inside of them. Uh, the architecture consists of four main components uh, that we've written, which are the snapshotter, uh, a control plugin, the runtime, and the agent. Um, so first is the snapshotter. This is responsible for exposing the uh, file system that is the container image to the container inside the VM. We wrote a snapshotter, like Noah was describing, that exposes things as block devices uh, that we can then pass through into the VM. The snapshotter currently runs as an out-of-process out of process gRPC proxy plugin. So it's a separate program that uh, Containerd talks to over a, a local Unix domain socket. Uh, we're also writing a control plugin uh, that provides an API for managing the lifecycle of each of the VMs uh, and invoking the uh, Firecracker VMM. This is because we want to be able to run more than one container inside the same VM. So we need to be able to model this as a uh, first class API that's a little bit different from the APIs that Containerd already has. This control plugin uh, right now is implemented as an in-process plugin, um, which is something that we're hoping to change in the future, but that's where it is right now. Uh, we also built a runtime 
that links containerd that runs outside the VM to uh, the agent component that runs inside the VM. This primarily acts as a proxy passing through the API calls that are made uh, outside the VM to the stuff that's inside so that we can actually run containers. Uh, it's implemented as an out of process uh, containerd v2 runtime uh, and communicates over a VSOC device to have commands go inside. The last thing that we have is the agent that runs inside the micro VM, and this mounts the snapshot images from the block devices and invokes run C via the uh, containerd's original run C shim uh, and creates standard Linux containers inside the micro VM. So we're going to talk about each of these a little bit more in depth. Uh, first is the block device snapshotter. So snapshotters, as we talked about a little bit before, are containerd's way of creating a usable root file system that's uh, available to a container from the container image. Uh, with Firecracker Container D, we store that container image on the host using the content store and using the uh, snapshotter that's there, but we needed a way to use that root file system inside the guest VM, and because there's no file system access between the host and the guest, we, had to, uh, we needed to build a different way to do that, so we ended up creating uh, block devices that act uh, that contain the file system, attach them to the VM with the Firecracker API, and then inside the VM we have to mount those block devices to make the file systems available. So there's a bunch of different ways to do this. Uh, we ended up building two different ones. Uh, the first one that we implemented was what we call a naive one, uh, which was really just a proof of concept so that we could get the rest of the system working. Um, and it was really, really simple. All we did was create uh, files, write a file system into that, and just use that file as a block device. And it meant that every time we had a new layer that we wanted to pull, we would have to copy the whole file. Or every time we wanted to start up a new container, we'd have to copy the whole file. Uh, and that has drawbacks both in terms of just this extra storage space for each of the copies of the file system that we're creating and the time that it takes to do those copies. So the second one uh, that we implemented is called the Device Mapper Snapshotter. Um, and it's one that we're more interested in bringing into production. It, if you've ever used uh, Docker's um, device mapper storage driver or graph driver, this is very similar. Um, so what we do is we create a like a thin pool uh, that has thinly provisioned devices. Uh, we write the file system into there, and then we create snapshots of those thin devices uh, and use those to write additional layers or create the snapshots that are the uh, finally available for the container file system. What that does is it means that um, when we're writing new layers, uh, the only data that ends up having to be written is the data that changes instead of copying the whole thing over and over again. Um, and we end up sharing that at the, the block level. So Device Mapper lets us have only the changed blocks. There were also two more that um, have started to appear from others, others in the container community. Uh, and so those are the LVM and the raw block snapshotters that are listed up there. Those have pretty much the same goals as the device mapper one that we wrote. Um, the device mapper, or sorry, the LVM one is, is uh, pretty interesting to us. It's very similar, but has a, somewhat of a different technique than the device mapper one that we wrote. And as that uh, matures and maybe gets merged into Containerd, uh, we might look at that instead of the one that we wrote. Um, so we're gonna evaluate it for performance and stability and see what is the right answer. The, the last one up here, the raw block one, uh, depends on a file system feature called uh, reflink, which is not available in all file systems that we might be running on top of. So it's only implemented, it's implemented in things like XFS or BTRFS, but not in ext4, and we'd still like uh, our project to be usable on systems that are using ext4. So we're a little bit less likely to look at that one, um, but all of these are, are have sort of the same goals in mind, uh, and we're interested in looking at those. The uh, device mapper one that we wrote, we ended up contributing to the Containerd project, and so the next release uh, of Containerd should have that as a built-in snapshotter. So the next thing that we can talk about is the control plugin that, we've, uh, that we're writing. Um, this is helping us manage uh, VM-specific settings, uh, like which kernel we should use, what is the root file system for the virtual machine itself, uh, what resources to allocate in terms of memory and CPU for the VM, uh, and how the whole thing should be configured. So along with information about how the VM itself uh, needs to be configured, this is, intended, this is really intended for the use case of running multiple containers inside the VM. We needed an API that wasn't tied to the lifecycle of an individual container, uh, 
so that we could compose things together. And that's what uh, we're building right now. This is today pretty specific to Firecracker uh, and Firecracker Container D, and we're building it that way so that we can get the thing working and prove that it's a concept that's worthwhile. Um, but we are talking with the Containerd maintainers about contributing something upstream that's a little bit less specific, a little bit more generic. We're just trying to get something working first uh, and make sure that we're going down the right path before we design a, a generic system without knowing everything that we're doing. Um, today, it's a compiled-in plugin, uh, partly because of the uh, way that's needed in order to add an API to Containerd's existing socket. Basically, requires that we run as a compiled-in plugin. Uh, and so it does mean that we have to build a separate copy of Containerd in order to run this, but uh, we're looking at how that can be changed in the future, either using uh, like Go dynamically linked plugins or uh, hopefully with something like a generic sandbox API that we don't have to implement separately on our, on our own. Um, so let's talk about the runtime. Uh, this runtime is responsible for proxying commands that originate from Containerd. Uh, to the, the components that are running inside the VM and also proxying things like container IO streams to the outside. Um, so we've implemented this as Containerd's v2 runtime API uh, instead of the OCI standard as it gave us a little bit more flexibility in how we implemented the runtime. The OCI standard, which is what RunC implements, is tied to a single process per container model because it's implemented as like a command line interface uh, for how to specify that. Containerd's v2 API gives us uh, a little bit more flexibility, um, and we're able to choose how many processes we need, and it makes lets us make choices that simplify the architecture for us. So we're implementing a model where we have a single runtime process per VM instead of per container, and it's responsible for all of those containers inside the same, the same VM. So the last thing up here is the agent. This is the component that runs inside of the VM and is ultimately responsible for creating standard Linux containers using RunC inside so this, this is the other half of the, the runtime. It receives all of the commands that the runtime is sending it uh, and does the other half of proxying IO streams, uh, sending events like container startup and container end events uh, and metrics from within the VM to uh, outside. We do use RunC inside the VM in order to manage the containers in order, so that we can make them look as similar as possible to standard Linux containers. They run with all of the same uh, things like cgroups and namespaces inside the VM so that the interface is, is the same. This component is also responsible for mapping a given block device that we've attached into the correct uh, root file system for a given container. Um, Firecracker today doesn't really have a mechanism to expose which block device is which after they've been attached. So we're working on approaches to map each, each block device to the appropriate container and to its file system. So I know that's a, a lot. Um, so what I'd like to do is go through uh, the components and see how they work together to run a set of containers inside the Firecracker VM. So we're going to start off with storage management and what's involved in exposing a root file system for a container. The orchestrator or client program, uh, which can be something like the Kubernetes container runtime interface or ECS, can start off by making a request to Containerd to create a snapshot from an image. Containerd then passes that request along to a snapshotter implementation like the one that we've written. The snapshotter then allocates a snapshot and responds back with an identifier for the snapshot. The Containerd daemon itself here acts mo mostly as a pass-through, and you'll see it act as a pass-through for many of the API actions. Once we have all the snapshots created, which we need as block devices, we can launch a VM. The orchestrator makes a request to the control plugin that we've written, asking it to start the VM. The Firecracker VMM is designed to run a single virtual machine, so we need to start a new VMM process, a new Firecracker process for every VM that we want to run. Because Firecracker needs to know which devices to use up front, it doesn't have any device hot plug, we need to include that information in the request, and that includes things like the devices that are ultimately going to hold the container file systems. So we'll pass in placeholder devices at this time, but we need to make sure that we have enough of them attached uh, so that we can run as many containers as we want to run inside there. Once the plugin has started a new Firecracker process and asked it to run a VM, it returns an identifier back to the orchestrator so that we have a handle to it. Then we can start to run some containers. So the orchestrator can make a request to uh, containers, Containerd container and task services, which are APIs uh, that are part of Containerd, uh, to run a container. Containerd then passes those through to the runtime that we've written uh, for Firecracker. 
In the request, it includes both the VM ID that we got in the previous step so we know which virtual machine we're targeting, as well as the snapshot ID that we want to use as the container's root file system, so that thing that was up earlier in the diagram. The runtime will then invoke the Firecracker API to attach this device, replacing one of the placeholder ones that we put there, and then ask the agent inside to mount that device. Once the device is mounted, we can then ask the agent to start RunC and launch the main process of the container. When the container starts running, we'll return all that information all the way back out to the orchestrator or the client program that's there. The orchestrator will probably want to know about what happens to the container, so it can subscribe to events like exits or metrics or things like that. And at some point, the container process might exit, either because it's been triggered to exit or because it exits on its own. The exits will be observed by the agent that is running inside the micro VM and then propagated out, so out to all the way to whatever is subscribed to it, so to the orchestrator or client program that's subscribed there. When all of the containers can exit, have exited, the orchestrator can make a request to the plugin to stop the VM, and then the plugin can terminate the firecracker process. And that's it. So Noah, I think, has some demo yeah. stuff. Are we like, out of time? Just uh, we have five minutes. Okay. <laughs> Um, so it's it's so we're not going to do a live demo. Um, we thought seriously about it, but uh, decided kind of not to. Um, so instead, we're, we, I just I captured the output of of running some stuff, and and I'm going to show sort of what we ran and, and what effect you have, uh, or what effect the firecracker process has on a container. So I'm, I'm going to compare um, a standard process using uh, the standard Linux primitives with a firecracker container D container. So this is a this is how you run a container in uh, uh, using container D directly as opposed to interfacing with it um, using a higher level tool like Docker. So what we're doing here is we're running a container that is the uh, Linux stress command, which is just a tool for running processes that exercise CPU or, or the VM system or, you know, or block devices or something along those lines. So we're going to spawn six processes uh, in this container, and we're going to see what that looks like. Um, so here we see that we're running a bunch of processes. This is from the host perspective. So we can see that even though this isn't a container, like the host still sees these these processes. And when we look you know, at the at the, the process tree, you know, we still see you know, we've got container D running, we've got the shim running and all of that sort of stuff. And then here, this is the, the container. And, and we, we can see that there are all of those stress processes running, um, that they, they exist in the process hierarchy. You can manipulate them. Uh, you can send them signals, things along those lines. That's all stuff that we sort of want to avoid. Like we don't, when we're talking about providing this enhanced isolation boundary, we're talking about hiding all of this stuff. Like we don't want to see that. We don't want that to see the rest of the system. So we're going to change. We're going to add a couple of firecracker uh, flags to a similar CTR run command. Um, so this is this is the same command essentially, except split across multiple lines. And what we've added is a custom runtime flag and a custom snapshotter. So we need to use the uh, our own snapshotter. In this case, it's the naive snapshotter that Sam talked about, which is the, the, the copy ahead of time uh, snapshotter. Um, and we're using the firecracker runtime. And what we see is when we, we do a pgrep for stress, we see that there aren't any stress processes running. We don't see them anymore. But we do see a firecracker process. And when we look at the process tree, um, what we see is that container D is now actually running Firecracker, and we see that it's got some uh, some kernel threads that are the the KVM um, uh, the KVM VM resources that are being used, and so that's all we see. And there's a VM now; it's running the exact same process. Um, we can see when we look using top that. There's a firecracker process that's using a bunch of the CPU. That's where that's the VM that has that is containing and isolating these this stress container. So this is this is what you'll see in when you're when you're using a a firecracker container D type container. Um, right now you can see you can see we didn't do anything along the lines of configuring any sort of, of networking or interacting with this thing at all. Um, 
but you know, that, that sort of stuff is, is still in the works. Uh, but th what this is trying to do is just demonstrate that, yes, we can actually run a container. It does work. It uses an off-the-shelf container. Like we use the same, you can see we use the same image from, from Docker Hub, and it, it, it works without any real uh, modification or anything along those lines. So that's, that's that. Um, I think with our current status, Talk about this from here. Sure. So the, uh, the current status is that um, we, we do have everything working, but a lot of it's still in the prototype or proof of concept stage. Um, we do know where we want to take this. We want to make it broadly useful for running containers with the boundary provided by a hypervisor uh, and separate kernel instead of the typical shared kernel. Um, we do have a few tactical things that we're working on right now, like moving away from Firecracker's current experimental VSOC support to something a little bit more fully supported and the block device identification issue that I talked about before. Um, but that's all, the, the goals, the actual goals driving these changes are running multiple containers per VM, uh, doing, supporting things like the Docker exec kind of workflows, things like health checks and metrics. Um, the, the biggest gap in container D right now, at least for me, is a way to manage groups of containers. Um, groups of containers that run together is required for running things like Kubernetes pods or ECS tasks and that's what we want to do with Firecracker Container D. These groups of containers are useful when modeling for, uh, security boundaries. They're all part of the same workload, and so we'd actually like to run them inside the same VM. Uh, containers and Kubernetes pods are expected to be able to share things like volumes and namespaces, and we expect that for some use cases in Amazon ECS as well. Um, so those are all more reasons to run things inside the same VM. Uh, CRI Container D is a built-in plugin that makes Container D work with Kubernetes and has to implement grouping like this internally today so that it can keep track of containers that run inside the same pod. Because it's useful as a security boundary, we want to run containers inside the same micro VM, and we want this model as an API in Container D. So there's still things where we haven't decided exactly how we want to go forward. Uh, some of the things are a little bit complicated by Firecracker's opinionated stance on having a very minimal device model and feature set, mostly because it helps uh, Firecracker make stronger arguments for security and speed. A big one is CRI, or Container Runtime Interface Conformance, so you can use Firecracker Container D with Kubernetes. CRI doesn't fully specify the containers that are eventually going to go into the same pod or same sandbox. This makes it hard to properly size the VM, as we don't know how much memory or CPU is eventually going to be needed. Uh, and Firecracker doesn't have the ability to dynamically change the amount of memory or CPU available to a VM after launch. CRI also requires some file system sharing for pods, and again, that's not something that we can do with Firecracker. CRI needs it for things like the Kubernetes downward config for secrets and so on. Um, a typical way this is done with virtual machines today is with the 9P file system protocol. Uh, you can see that if you use QEMU, or, and it's used by the Kata Containers project. However, Firecracker doesn't have any support for doing file system sharing, doesn't plan to support 9P, and so we need a different approach. We're looking at options um, like Vertio FS, which is a new uh, uh, shared file system over the Vertio device, um, or things like NFS or other ideas for where we can expose uh, file systems into containers. If you want to get involved, we would love that. This is an open source project. It's definitely being, um, like, we as AWS are developing it, but if you are interested in being involved, we're happy to have you. Uh, that can be as simple as just trying out the program and using it and reporting bugs, or as much as uh, contributing or even coming to work with us. Um, our GitHub repository has all the code that we're working on, and we're trying to put our design docs up in there too, so you can read about things and how we're thinking. We hang out in the Firecracker Slack in the Container D, Container D channel. Uh, the link up there will get you an invite to the Slack. Um, and if you're interested in working at AWS, uh, the Containers Group is hiring across all of our services, including uh, ECS, EKS, ECR, Fargate, and the lower level infrastructure like our team. So I don't think we have a ton of time left, but uh, we can do a little bit of Q&A. And I think Noah and I are both going to be around in the hallway right after this talk if you don't catch us right now. Yes? I just want to leave the room and make sure I'm absolutely clear about this. But because this is a VM, it is going to be running its own kernel versus the host kernel. Yeah. Correct. We, we do run a separate kernel in the VM. And you can, like that, it doesn't have to be the same, like, 
kernel version that's available on the host can be completely different. Yeah, we actually do require some specific kernel settings. Like, for example, Firecracker doesn't support an initial RAM disk, so you need to have all the drivers for the to, in order to run the, the VM compiled statically into the kernel image. Um, it's also a good opportunity for optimization. Strip out as much as you can from that kernel build, only the specific things that you really need. Lean and beam kernel. I'm sorry? It would be a lean and beam kernel. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, pretty much. Is, yeah. is building that kernel a part of what you have in the repositories or how you build that? Or? No, it's not part of our repositories. It is um, the, the Firecracker project itself does have a kernel config that they publish. Um, and we, 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 we probably should be publishing our own kernel config because Firecracker doesn't actually, the, the mainline Firecracker doesn't use VSOC for anything. We do. So their, their example uh, kernel configs and kernel binaries that they build are actually not suitable for use in this. Um, you need a little bit of, of additional change. Yeah. Yes. So the Kotlin maintenance project also implements a support for the supervisor isolated from the parents. Do you know if So some of the high-level differences are that the Kata Containers project is focused a little bit on more on being generic than we are. Um, we're focused on a single uh, hypervisor or VMM, which is 